Greetings, we are at Senior English A, and our objective now for the hour is to continue with the Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the Partner's Tale. Now, we were commenting on the Partner's Prologue in our last session, now we will turn to the tale, the story of the Partner. I hope you have notes in front of you, I hope you have 127 open, we'll be ready here in a moment to do a close reading of this, but before we get there, I want to make a couple of quick observations. One, the first thing I want to say is a repeating of what I said in our earlier session. There is always some kind of a relationship between the introduction of a character, the partner's prologue, and the story that the character tells, the partner's tale. There is a relationship between the two. When we finish the partner's tale, I'm going to ask you what that relationship is between the partner's prologue and the partner's tale. Number two, you want to put this in your notes. This story, like several other stories of Canterbury Tales, Chaucer did not invent. This is a very old story. All right? It is in many ways almost like a fable. That is to say, it's a story that kind of has a moral to it. Do you got me? Now, you'll remember at the very beginning of the partner's prologue, he said, I love to preach in churches, and I only preach about one sin. What is that one sin? Greed. We wrote it down yesterday with three words. Greed, avarice, avarice and cupidity. Outstanding. Greed, avarice, cupidity. All means the same thing. In other words, wanting something that you probably don't need. So the story that he's going to tell is obviously going to have something to do with greed. So let's write that down right away. We already know, we already know that something about this story is going to have to do with greed or avarice or cupidity. All right? There's two parts to this story. Let me outline them for you and then we're just going to read the story. Two parts to the story. Part one, he's going to tell a little story or a fable. It's going to be a story about three brothers who have an adventure. You'll only appreciate the opening of the story if you know that in Chaucer's day, plagues came through. What is that? The bubonic plague came through. It killed lots of people. It's an illness. And lots of people died. There was a guy who would bring a wagon through. And you brought your dead people out and put them on this wagon. If you know your Monty Python's Holy Grail, you know this scene now. Bring out your dead, bring out your dead. This is what they did. They stuck them on a... Then they took them outside of town. The guy's job who it was to walk all these dead bodies out, not a very good job, on the front of his cart, he had a bell. And he would ring it out loud. The reason for the bell was so that people would not go near his cart. When you heard the bell, you knew somebody had died. Do you got me? There was a body on this cart or whatever. So our story is going to begin there. Three brothers hanging out in a bar, getting drunk, when they hear this bell and they ask about who died. There will be some irony that will follow, and then the adventure to come. Part two of the story. After the partner finishes telling the story, he goes from storytelling to preaching. In other words, he moves from telling the story to being like if, if, if he was in a church and immediately starts to ask people for their money so he can pardon them. Put it in your notes. He clearly has forgotten that just a few minutes before he admitted that he is a holy vicious man and that he sees this whole project as a game, and that he's been playing the game for a long time. And the reason he plays it is to get right people's bank, right? So he's going to almost like completely have forgotten that. And by the end of our story, in fact, there might even be a little bit of a, a, of a uh, contest or, or uh, the, the host himself gets a little bit offended. All right, here we go. We're now doing a close reading of the text. You're just paying attention, reading along. All right, here we go. The Partner's Tale. It's of three rioters I have to tell, who, long before the morning service bell, were sitting in a tavern for a drink. And as they sat, they heard the handbell clink before a coffin going to the grave. One of them called the little tavern knave and said, 
Go and find out at once. Look spry. Whose corpse is in that coffin passing by? And so you get the name correctly, too. Sir, said the boy, no need, I promise you. Two hours before you came here, I was told. He was a friend of yours in days of old. And suddenly, last night, the man was slain upon his bench, face up, dead drunk again. There came a privy thief, we call him Death, who kills us all round here, and in a breath he speared him through the heart. He never stirred. And then Death went his way without a word. He's killed a thousand in the present plague, and, sir, it doesn't do to be too vague if you should meet him. You had best be wary, be on your guard with such an adversary. Be primed to meet him everywhere you go. That's what my mother said. It's all I know. The publican joined in with, By St. Mary, what the child says is right. You best be wary. This very year he killed, in a large village a mile away, man, woman, serf at tillage, page in the household, children, all there were. Yes, I imagine that he lives round there. It's well to be prepared in these alarms. He might do you dishonor. Huh, God's arms, the rioter said. Is he so fierce to meet? I'll search for him by Jesus, street by street. God's blessed bones, I'll register a vow. Here, chaps, the three of us together now. Hold up your hands like me, and we'll be brothers in this affair, and each defend the others. And we will kill this traitor death, I say. Away with him, as he had made away with all our friends. God's dignity, tonight. They made their bargain, swore with appetite these three to live and die for one another, as brother born might swear to his born brother. And up they started in their drunken rage, and made towards this village which the page and publican had spoken of before. Many and grisly were the oaths they swore, tearing Christ's blessed body to a shred. If we can only catch him, death is dead. When they had gone not fully half a mile, just as they were about to cross a stile, they came upon a very poor old man who humbly greeted them, and thus began, God look to you, my lords, and give you quiet. To which the proudest of these men of riot gave back the answer, What, old fool, give place. Why are you all wrapped up except your face? Why live so long? Isn't it time to die? The old, old fellow looked him in the eye and said, Because I never yet have found, though I have walked to India, searching round village and city on my pilgrimage, one who would change his youth to have my age. And so my age is mine, and must be still upon me for such time as God may will. Not even death, alas, will take my life. So, like a wretched prisoner at strife within himself, I walk alone and wait about the earth, which is my mother's gate. Knock, knocking with my staff from night to noon, and crying, Mother, open to me soon. Look at me, mother, won't you let me in? See how I wither, flesh and blood and skin. Alas, when will these bones be laid to rest? Mother, I would exchange, for that were best, the wardrobe in my chamber, standing there so long for yours. I, for a shirt of hair to wrap me in. She has refused her grace, whence comes the pallor of my withered face. But it dishonored you when you began to speak so roughly, sir, to an old man, unless he had injured you in word or deed. It says in holy writ, as you may read, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor it. And therefore, be it said, do no more harm to an old man than you, being now young, would have another do when you are old, if you should live till then. And so may God be with you, gentlemen, for I must go whither I have to go. Thank God, the gambler said. You shan't do so. You don't get off so easy by St. John. I heard you mention, just a moment gone, a certain traitor, Death, who singles out and kills the fine young fellows hereabout. And you're his spy, by God. You wait a bit. Say where he is, or you shall pay for it by God and by the Holy Sacrament. I say you've joined together by consent to kill us younger folk, 
you thieving swine. Well, sirs, he said, if it be your design to find out death, turn up this crooked way towards that grove. I left him there today under a tree, and there you'll find him waiting. He isn't one to hide for all your prating. You see that oak? He won't be far to find. And God protect you that redeemed mankind, I, and amend you. Thus, that ancient man. At once, the three young rioters began to run and reached the tree, and there they found a pile of gold florins on the ground, new coined, eight bushels of them as they thought. No longer was it death those fellows sought. For they were all so thrilled to see the sight. The florins were so beautiful and bright that down they sat beside the precious pile. The wickedest spoke first after a while. Brothers, he said, you listen to what I say. I'm pretty sharp, although I joke away. It's clear that fortune has bestowed this treasure to let us live in jollity and pleasure. Light come, light go, we'll spend it as we ought. God's precious dignity, who would have thought this morning was to be our lucky day? If one could only get the gold away, back to my house, or else to yours, perhaps, for, as you know, the gold is ours, chaps, we'd all be at the top of fortune, hey? But certainly it can't be done by day. People would call us robbers, a strong gang, so our own property would make us hang. No, we must bring this treasure back by night, some prudent way, and keep it out of sight. And so, as a solution, I propose we draw for lots and see the way it goes. The one who draws the longest lucky man shall run to town as quickly as he can to fetch us bread and wine but keep things dark, while two remain in hiding, here to mark our heap of treasure. If there's no delay, when night comes down, we'll carry it away, all three of us, wherever we have planned. He gathered lots and hid them in his hand, bidding them draw for where the luck should fall. It fell upon the youngest of them all, and off he ran at once towards the town. As soon as he had gone, the first sat down and thus began a parley with the other. You know that you can trust me as a brother. Now, let me tell you where your profit lies. You know our friend has gone to get supplies, and here's a lot of gold that is to be divided equally amongst us three. Nevertheless, if I could shape things thus so that we shared it out, the two of us, wouldn't you take it as a friendly act? But how, the other said. He knows the fact that all the gold was left with me and you. What can we tell him? What are we to do? Is it a bargain, said the first, or no? For I can tell you in a word or so what's to be done to bring the thing about. Trust me, the other said. You needn't doubt my word. I won't betray you. I'll be true. Well, said his friend, you see that we are two, and two are twice as powerful as one. Now look. When he comes back, get up in fun to have a wrestle. Then, as you attack, I'll up and put my dagger through his back while you and he are struggling as in a game. Then draw your dagger too and do the same. Then all this money will be ours to spend. Divided equally, of course, dear friend. Then we can gratify our lusts and fill the day with dicing at our own sweet will. Thus, these two miscreants agreed to slay the third and youngest, as you heard me say. The youngest, as he ran towards the town, kept turning over, rolling up and down within his heart the beauty of those bright new florins, saying, Lord, to think I might have all that treasure to myself alone. Could there be anyone beneath the throne of God so happy as I then should be? And so the fiend, our common enemy, was given power to put it in his thought that there was always poison to be bought, and that with poison he could kill his friends. To men in such a state, the devil sends thoughts of this kind, and has a full permission to lure them on to sorrow and perdition, for this young man was utterly content to kill them both, and never to repent. And on he ran. He had no thought to tarry came to the town, found an apothecary, and said, Sell me some poison, if you will. I have a lot of rats I want to kill. 
And there's a polecat, too, about my yard that takes my chickens, and it hits me hard. But I'll get even, as is only right, with vermin that destroy a man by night. The chemist answered, I've a preparation which you shall have, and by my soul's salvation, if any living creature eat or drink a mouthful, ere he has the time to think, though he took less than makes a grain of wheat, you'll see him fall down dying at your feet. Yes, die he must. And in so short a while, you'd hardly have the time to walk a mile. The poison is so strong, you understand? This cursed fellow grabbed into his hand the box of poison, and away he ran into a neighboring street, and found a man who lent him three large bottles. He withdrew and deftly poured the poison into two. He kept the third one clean, as well he might, for his own drink, meaning to work all night stacking the gold and carrying it away. And when this rioter, this devil's clay, had filled his bottles up with wine, all three, back to rejoin his comrades, sauntered he. Why make a sermon of it? Why waste breath? Exactly in the way they'd planned his death, they fell on him and slew him, two to one. Then, said the first of them, when this was done, Now for a drink. Sit down and let's be merry, for later on there'll be the corpse to bury. And as it happened, reaching for a sup, he took a bottle full of poison up and drank, and his companion, nothing loath, drank from it also, and they perished, both. There is, in Avicenna's long relation concerning poison and its operation, trust me, no ghastlier section to transcend what these two wretches suffered at their end. Thus, these two murderers received their due. So did the treacherous young poisoner, too. O oh, cursed sin, O oh, blaggardly excess, O oh, treacherous homicide, O oh, wickedness, O oh, gluttony that lusted on and diced, O oh, blasphemy that took the name of Christ with habit-hardened oaths that pride began. Alas, how comes it that a mortal man, that thou to thy creator, him that wrought thee, that paid his precious blood for thee and bought thee, art so unnatural and false within? Dearly beloved, God forgive your sin and keep you from the vice of avarice. My holy pardon frees you all of this, provided that you make the right approaches, that is, with sterling rings or silver brooches. Bow down your heads under this holy bull. Come on, you women, offer up your wool. I'll write your name into my ledger, so into the bliss of heaven you shall go, for I'll absolve you by my holy power. You that make offering clean as at the hour when you were born. That, sirs, is how I preach. And Jesu Christ, soul's healer, I, the leech of every soul, grant pardon and relieve you of sin. For that is best. I won't deceive you. What's ironic about the last line is, I won't deceive you. Right, right, right. There's obviously, obviously he's full of, he's, he's full of deception all the time. He admitted it. All right, let's talk through it real quickly for your, for your annotations, all right? It's an interesting story. It's not one that Chaucer himself created. It's one that his readers already kind of knew. But it's going to work rather nicely in terms of what the partner's objective is. So now we're ready to go to work with it. Okay, so it's a story about three brothers hanging out in a bar, they hear that a dead body is going by, they find out that death has killed them, because they're drunk, they get together and decide they're all going to go out and find death and kill it. You go ahead and write down in your notes what's ironic about that. You're all right. You can't kill death, can you, right? Okay, so there's obvious irony there. They go down the road, they find an old man. The old man says that I've been knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Heaven won't let me in. In other words, I can't die yet, but I'm waiting. How do they treat the old man? They don't treat him well at all. They don't show respect, correct? They don't show any respect because he's older. And they say back to him, whoa, 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 what was this thing about death? You just said something about death. That's who we're looking for, and we think you're, you're it. And the old man says, it ain't me. But if you go down the road, I think I saw him just a few seconds ago. They go down the road, go around the bend, don't see death, but see a million dollars of coinage sitting in the middle of the road. Immediately, the, the uh, storyteller tells us they've completely forgotten about death, 
And now they're just interested in what? The money. Yes. We got a little bank here. Problem. We can't take this money under cover of day. People are going to know. They're going to see and they're going to think that we're robbers. So what we got to do is we got to take it at nighttime. The way we're going to do this is we're going to divide up. Two of us are going to stay with the money. One of us is going to go back and get some brewskis, a little bit of food. Then we'll take this stuff in the nighttime. As soon as the youngest goes away, the other two say, gold splits better between two than between three. When he comes back, let's just jack him in and it'll all be over with. Then we'll have more money for ourselves. Great idea. The young kid walking back towards town says, gold splits better one way than three. I'm going to take rat poison and put it in the drinks, except for my own. They'll drink from the bottles. They'll both die. I'll have all the money. Yes. He shows up. The two guys jump him. They kill him, stab him in the back. He falls on the pile of gold. The other two guys go, man, killing somebody takes a lot of effort. Let's have a drink. They drink from the two bottles with the rat poison in it. And all three of the guys at the end of the story are laying on top of the gold. <coughs> of course, let's point out, they went out searching for... And guess what? Found they that. found that. You got it. They found that. So in other words, they found what they were looking for, <laughs> namely death. Of course, it was a little bit ironic the way they found it. Correct? Then at the very end of our story, the partner says, that's pretty much how I like to preach. And how about it? Let's offer up now some money so I can forgive your uh, sins. Right? Now, very simple story. The question we want to ask, though, is this one. What is the relationship between the prologue and the tale? Go ahead and write something down. What is the relationship between the prologue and the tale? How do they fit together? Greed. greed. That's going to be our key, isn't it? Greed or avarice or cupidity is going to be our key, isn't it? Right? The partner will preach against avarice or greed. Because he wants the yokels to feel guilty about being greedy. They will recognize that greed is a sin. They will want to be pardoned of that sin. And how will they be pardoned? By paying the partner money. So the partner can get their money. He can be greedy himself. Even though he's telling a story about greed. Got me? Fairly easy, if you will, fairly easy way to think about the partner and the partner's tale. Final question for your notes. What really do you think is the point Chaucer is trying to make to the readers of his story? What really is the point? That people are too greedy and greed, greed ends up killing Greed people. can kill you. Let's make a list. This is, we're working at 2A now. These are messages. Greed can kill you. Greed is bad for you. What else? What other points do you think Chaucer is trying to make here? That not everything's what it seems. Things are not always what they appear to be. Namely, what's the last line of the partner's tale? I won't deceive you. Who says that? Who says that? The partner says that, doesn't he? Right? Of course, what's ironic about that? What do we already know about the partner? He's, he's, he's always lying. He's always deceiving. You got it. Finally, Chaucer maybe has a point or an agenda here. He wants to educate the common people about what? I'll help you. Chaucer's project is beware of blank. You fill in the blank. Beware of blame. Now, you could say beware of greed, but we got to be honest, it's pretty evident. Chaucer has another deeper project. Remember, I told you, he's got something against what institution? <laughs> the church. The church. What, but would he say beware of the church? No. Beware of what? Write it down. Beware of what? Beware of the hypocrites or deceivers within the church. Right. So, in other words, when somebody comes to you, who says that they're religious and asks for your money, be careful. 
Don't just assume things about people because they say they are what they are. Now, by extension, of course, Chaucer could be making the argument or the observation, you have to be careful when you go out into the, into the quote unquote real world, right, that you've got to know people for a long time before you can trust them. Don't just so easily give people your trust, right? You've got to be able to kind of think about it, correct? Uh, check things out. Question, how will you know once you leave the confines of your small town and you go out somewhere where you're around people that you don't know all your life? How will you know if you can trust them? Well, that's very unsettling. How can you know? You have to earn trust. Yeah, but you're going to meet lots and lots of people that you're going to have to trust. How are you going to know if you can trust them or not? You, can, you don't ever know. You don't know. So, for example, you're away at college, you're at the party, somebody says, hey, come on, this is what we're going to do, it's going to be great. How do you know you can trust them, though? How do you know that they have your best interests at heart. They seem really nice, and lots of times girls will say, and he was so good looking, he was so people cute. Are selfish. What are your thoughts on that, though? How can you know that people are selfish? Especially what if they come out looking like they're not selfish? What if they come out looking like they're really nice? They act like they're really nice. The partner, the partner can act like he's really nice. Remember, when he's explaining he's a complete hypocrite, he's doing it kind of not in front of church. He's doing it to a bunch of people on a little group outing. And he's been drinking, and so his tongue is a little loose, probably saying things he shouldn't be saying. The summoner would be saying that to him. Pal, you've got to shut this up. We can't, run our get we can't run our scam if you're telling everybody, right? Mm -hmm. hmm, how do you know? Is there any way to know? If people are honest or not, or do you have to just kind of assume things, right? Just kind of assume things. All right, there you go. The partner's tale. Real quick.